Well, it's been a little bit of a chaotic week or 10 days, so hope everybody's calmed down from some of that. Um, as, as you're listening to me talk tonight, if you would like to, um, as you're breathing, when you, especially when you exhale, just send a little bit of, uh, of uh, compassion, goodwill, whatever you'd like to call it, to all the people who may be uh, affected by some of the things happening in the, in the country and the world over the last, uh, last number of days. So I'm going to take a little detour to start, start things off. Um, uh, a little his, very small history lesson here. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the Tao Te Ching, it's one of the, one of the main um, writings from the Taoist tradition. Uh, it's probably the most well-known in the world because partially it's the shortest, one of the shortest, and it's been translated innumerable times in lots of languages. Um, and ironically, the, the uh, person that it's a, uh, the attributed author of it, who's usually referred to as Lao Tzu, um, in an ancient history of China, he was um, described as being the um, archivist or librarian of uh, the Zhou dynasty. Um, and when he saw that the, um, some of the political situations weren't going so well at the moment, he decided to depart for the West. And uh, one of his students, who was a gatekeeper in the West, um, asked him to please leave, leave something behind for us. <laughs> and he wrote the Daddy Ching. Most likely some of it was written by other people later and com commented on, but that's, that's the story. Um, and this was, dur this was approximately 2,500 or so years ago during a period in China, which is commonly referred to as the Warring States period. So in some ways not unlike our, our current age. Um, as I was uh, uh, preparing for tonight's talk, I was look, looking through some, some of my versions of the Tao Ching, and uh, um, either fortunately or unfortunately, uh, almost every other verse resonated as, wow, this is just like what's happening today. <laughs> this is just what's happening today. Um, so the Tao Te Ching is, is written at many levels. Um, on, on the one hand, it's a, it's a self-cultivation or meditation manual which is maybe its primary intent, but it can be interpreted lots of different ways. Um, it has lots of different layers in it. Um, it's often translated as a treatise on how to operate government well. Um, um, although you could also look at that aspect of it also, how do you govern yourself well as well. Too many wells there, but you get the idea. So I wanna, I wanna read one verse that, that relates to something going on in our current situation. And then I'll get back to our, to the main, uh, main topic of the talk, although this is related. So this is chapter 24 of the Daddy Ching. On tiptoe, one cannot stand. Astride, one cannot walk. Displaying oneself, one cannot shine. Asserting oneself, one cannot flourish. Showing off, one cannot succeed. Conceited, one cannot endure. Within the Tao, this is called excess food, wasteful activity that all beings detest. Therefore, the individual with the Tao does not indulge. Okay, so getting back to our main topic, which is uh, dissolving methods. Um, one, of the, one of the things that the Taoists relate to and use a lot um, in their practices is, um, is water. Um, if you think of that, that's the, you know, one of the most primary things on the earth. It's what our bodies are primarily made of. And it has a lot of characteristics that that the Taoists appreciated and, and learned from and used in their practices. Um, and if you think of dissolving, that's obviously something water is, is capable of doing. So we'll be talking about how, um, how that dissolving concept and, and water work in some of these practices. So the, the, the basic level um, 
um, Nagong practice related to water um, is for a moment, I'll actually mention the system because it's, it's what I'm teaching in my workshop this weekend if anyone locally is interested. Um, there's a neighboring system called opening the energy gates of your body, qigong, which is kind of the basic foundational level neigong practices. And one of the practices from that is, is a standing practice where you essentially, um, and you can learn it in stages, but you essentially do two things simultaneously. You are sinking energy down through your body. So in the same way water flows, generally flows down. And then also as you find places in your body that are stuck, energetic blockages, physical blockages, whatever, um, you dissolve those. We'll talk more about that as we go along to kind of clear those out of your system. So let me, let me begin this section by talking, uh, by once again reading another verse from the Daddy Ching. Um, this is from chapter eight. It's not the entire verse, but the first half of it. Um, the supreme excellence is to be like water. Water's excellence benefits the 10,000 things, yet it does not struggle. It settles in the place that many people reject. Therefore, it is close to the Tao. And, and the general concept with the Tao is that it is everything. So, you know, the entire universe, everything that exists, whatever, the Tao is what we consider that to be the Tao. So water is, is, the characteristics of water is something that, that, that exemplifies that concept and also how it works. Um, one, of, one of the big things in Taoism is yin and yang, which the symbol, the Tai Chi symbol here next to me represents. And if you think of water, it's the softest thing. You know, you can stick anything into it. You can drop a, you know, a, an airplane into the water and it will just sink. <laughs> Um, but what's the other aspect of water? Things like tsunamis, hurricanes, floods, those are very young things. So water has the characteristics all the way through the spectrum of yin and yang. So the uh, thing about um, it does not struggle, that's kind of what I was talking about. It, it allows almost anything to happen to it. Um, the third line there, it settles in the place that many people reject. That's kind of an allusion to this concept of sinking through your body um, or sinking chi through your body. If you think about water, I brought this, this picture specifically, which is a, of a waterfall, the water dropping down below. That's just naturally the way water works. If you put water somewhere, it's always going to find the lowest place. In terms of our bodies and our health, that's useful because it'll, it will often go to the places where things aren't quite working right, and we can use that to help clear things out. Um, so the, the process, uh, which we'll do, in, we'll practice slightly in a minute, is um, basically just we're going to start at the top of our head and kind of work our way down through the body. But what we're actually after is a characteristic which in Chinese uh, is referred to, the Chinese term is sung, which is usually translated in English into the word relax. But you know, we think of relaxing as you know, like you know, Sunday the Super Bowl's on, I'm gonna open a beer, sit in my comfy chair, watch the game, whatever it is. Um, but sung is, is, a, is a sense of relaxation but still being very alive. So it's the type of, um, type of energy, I, I, you know, having lived in uh, or been to places where there are palm trees, you know, a big palm tree, you can actually pull it down. If you can somehow grab the top, you can pull it all the way down to the ground and it will just kind of flop back up like this. But it will always have that kind of relaxedness, but it has a certain life to it as well. So it isn't just collapsing anything in your body. It's just, it's, it's relaxing, but with that alive, alive sense. <laughs> And this is one of those things that's hard, hard to learn for most people because we tend to carry a lot of stuff with us, whether it be physical pain, energetic problems, emotional things, karma, you know, it could be karmic things. You want to get into more meditation, which we'll talk about later. Um, so one, one of the practices uh, I'd like to demonstrate uh, when, I, when I'm teaching this, how to do this. Let me ask, and I'm, I know who I will pick if nobody else wants to do it, but um, is there anybody who has any kind of like 
shoulder problem or something like that. Neck or shoulder. I mean, almost everybody has some kind of neck or shoulder thing. Nobody specifically. Great. Do you mind coming up here for a second? <laughs> this is your 15 minutes of fame, or 15 seconds of fame here. So um, if you want to just stand maybe right in front of the chair here. So um, is there one side that's maybe tenser than the other? Great. Left. Right. So the, the idea here is that what, what you're going to do is lift up your arm here and just kind of give, just give me the weight of your arm. So, right. So at some point, what I'm going to do is just drop his arm. And I don't know if you, you can see, you're, you're a little bit relaxed, actually. But right at the end there, it was a little bit of a catch as it went down. But what we're actually after, I'm going to do a little bit higher here. Let's see what happens from up there. Yeah. So again, I don't know if you could see it out there, but I, I can see it because I've done this a lot. There's a little bit of tension, like we all want to hold our arm up. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just let it go. So let me have you do this to me. So I'm just going to give you the weight of my arm. And just watch my arm to see if it does anything different. You can let go whenever you want. Could you see more how it just kind of flopped down and there's not a lot so of... Kind of back yeah, a yeah. Because yeah. I've been doing this a long time, so I'm used to not holding nervous tension in that area. Does that make sense? So, and, th and this is a thank you, I forgot. What's yeah. your name? John. John, thanks very much, John. Thank you. Um, so, you know, when I teach this, I have people do this with each other a lot because it's, it's one of those things that we get stuck in our nervous system that we, we want things to be a certain way or we want, you know, we don't want to let things go. And what's really strange, humans are really interesting monkeys in that we don't want to let go of things even if they're bad for us because they're, you know, because they're still give us a sense of security. So it's, it's a tricky thing to just let parts of your system or being just go. But that's the, that's the essence of this practice, is you want to be able to, if you find something in your system that you'd rather not have be there, let it go away. Okay. And the first place we're going to let it go away to um, as we do this practice, well, for the first step is we're just going to kind of let it um, go down through our body and kind of flow out the bottom. Um, if you look at, um, you know, there's lots of energetic systems in lots of different traditions, but they all basically have one thing in common, which is there's some connection up here that connects us to what's usually called, the Chinese always call it the heavens. Um, it could just be the universe, whatever. Um, and then below us, which we're greatly affected by, is the earth. And that is usually, we're connected to that down below our feet. So what I'm going to have you do is um, stand up for a minute. And if, if you can, if you can't stand up, that's fine. The reason these practices are done, or this initial practice is done standing up, is because, because we live on the earth, we have the constant effect of gravity. And the more you can keep your body alignments in good shape while you're doing this, the better the energy will flow through your system. So that's the general idea. Um, in my workshop, I go into great endless detail about body alignments. I'm not going to take the time tonight, but I'll give, you, I'll give you a few just to get started. So let's stand up. I'll do that as well. Although I could be lazy and sit down and do it, but I'll, I'll stand up too. So just a couple really quick things. Um, just have your feet kind of parallel. Um, and you want to have your knees bent rather than locked. And if you have your elbows a little bit bent and your palms kind of facing backwards, kind of like you're a coat and you got hung on a hanger and the arms just kind of hang there. And just make sure your head is kind of right above your body, not kind of sticking forward or anything like that. And if you can kind of relax your chest, I'm sorry to bounce on the microphone there, um, relax your chest and breathe deeply in your belly um, through your nose. And if you want to, um, I'd recommend putting your tongue on the roof of your mouth. I won't go into why, but that's, I'll just say that for right now. And go ahead and close your eyes. And the reason we're closing our eyes is because you can maybe feel inside your body a little bit better if you do that. We take in a lot of information through our eyes, so having those be closed can be very helpful for this. And then with your mind, or your intention, whatever, whatever you want to call it, your awareness, just start right at the top of your head. And just notice whatever you notice there. It doesn't matter what it is. When you first do this, chances are you're going to uh, notice or feel more physical things or things in your physical body. And a few things you can kind of keep an eye out for are there's four things. Um, any sense of strength, tension, 
contraction, or otherwise anything that just doesn't quite feel right. So just at that level, notice everything you can. And then whatever's left over, just sink it down to the next level. So maybe the level of your forehead. And you're going to go all the way around that level. Notice what's there. If something naturally releases out away from your body, just allow it to do that. And just always starting at the surface and going as deep as you can feel. Eventually you can feel deep, deep inside your body, but to start, you have to start somewhere more on the surface. And then down to the level of your eyes. We tend to hold a lot of tension in our eyes because we use them a lot for taking in information. Also just behind your eye is your optic nerve, which goes right into your brain. That's a good place to become aware of and notice what's going on there. But again, all the way around. Releasing if it just naturally releases away from your body. And then down through the rest of your head. So down through your nose, your ears, the back of your head, your jaw, your tongue, the vertebrae in the top part of your neck. Noticing what's there and then just sinking everything down to the next level. And then down through your throat. And down to your shoulders, the top of your shoulders, the front in front of your shoulders, the shoulder blade in the back, your armpit underneath, all the way around down the center of your throat and chest, the, the uh, top of your spine between your shoulder blades. So I'll be starting all the way around. And then down your upper arms, your chest where your ribs are, that part of your spine. Again, starting with the surface, eventually going deeper into the organs like your lungs and your heart, and whatever else is in there. Most people have an easier time feeling their heart because it's always beating and their lungs because you're always breathing. But some of the other organs and things are harder to feel. But eventually you can do that. And then down to the level of your elbows and your diaphragm. See if you can feel your diaphragm as you breathe all the way through your body. I should say that if you, if you feel dizzy or anything like that, feel free to sit down. And then down into the lower part of your belly, where your stomach is, around to the back, your kidneys in the back, your liver's on the right, spleen on the left. If you can feel that deep, that's great. But just go in as deep as you can, noticing what you feel, allowing anything to release away. And if you're familiar with your lower dantian or second, I believe, chakra, you can go to that area. Again, feel it and release, release if you can. And then down into your hips and pelvis, through your hands, all the muscles, intestines, everything that's in that area. Really with your mind. So not, not visualizing what's there, but actually trying to feel what's happening there. And then down into your legs. The big muscles in your legs, all the way to the end of all your fingers. Starting at the surface, the skin, the muscles, eventually going into the bone and the bone marrow when your awareness increases. Down through your knees. Feel all the way around your knees, eventually into the center, and down into your calf muscles in the lower part of your leg, always going in a downward direction, letting everything sink down through your leg, into your ankles, 
front, back, sides of your ankle, back where your Achilles tendon is, sinking down into your foot. See if you can feel not just the surface of your foot, but into your foot a little bit. The bones, the muscles, the space between the bones. Can you feel all the way out to the ends of all of your toes? And then the entire bottom of your foot that's touching the ground. And then continuing to sink everything down below your physical body into your energy or etheric body that extends a little bit outside your physical body. Again, always letting everything flow in a downward direction. And just let everything else sink and clear out. Take a couple more good breaths. And when you're done, I'd recommend that you just um, allow your eyes to open very slowly to allow the light to come back in. And also rub your hands together and just a little rub down your face and neck. Often doing this practice can get blood and energy stuck in your head. So, good. Everybody doing good? And out there as well? Great. Great, go ahead and have a seat again. So that's kind of the basic um, practice of seeking chi through the body. Um, so some of the things, and you might, you know, there's all kinds of things that you might have felt. Some of the some of the common ones I wanted to mention, um, in terms of what happens uh, um, in your in your physicality when you practice this, most people will find that their breathing can relax more, partially because you're relaxing some of the connections that allow that to work better, especially the diaphragm I mentioned as we were doing that, which you know go, is a muscle that goes right through your torso and ultimately connects to everything up and down. So the more your diaphragm can be relaxed, the more the breathing mechanism as well as other places in your body can become relaxed as well. Um, the alignment, I, I gave you literally three or four alignments. There's literally dozens of them, so I didn't go through all of those, but um, generally you'll relax into those alignments a little bit more easily. They're often awkward when you're first learning and they get a little bit easier along the way. Um, your muscles tend to soften, the joints tend to expand, and fluid can get into the joints. Um, the feet will open up, which allows it to hold the weight of your body a little bit more efficiently. And getting back to the theme of water, um, the inside of one's body tends to get feel like it's more wet or more moist. Again, part, you know, we're a lot, a lot of our body is water and fluids, um, and the more that they're not impeded in going through our system, they can do their job better. So blood, um, lymphatic fluid for your immune system, cerebrospinal fluid, um, synovial fluid in your joints, all those things tend to get more efficient, which seems kind of a paradox. We're just standing, how do these things happen? Um, but our body is controlled by our, not just by our physical tissue, there's the nerves and the energy that runs our body. So working with that, it can help, help these things um, work better. Um, one important thing, if, should you choose to practice this um, more, is that the process of sinking through your body is not dropping things, so you don't want to collapse things on top of each other. And again, if you, if you have a chance to learn more of the alignments, there's all kinds of practices for keeping your body open so that that doesn't happen. And this is what happens with gravity. We have to constantly kind of fight against the force of gravity to keep things in our body open. You know, what's a common thing that happens um, when people get older. I, I, I often tell the story of my first Tai Chi teacher who, um, when she was asked, why do you do Tai Chi? She said, because I see lots of older women who look like this. <laughs> you know, their whole body is kind of shrink and compress. She's now one of those older women, but her body is not that compressed <laughs> anymore or, or at all. So that's nice to see. Um, eventually, uh, go, going uh, kind of to the next level of doing this, um, this concept of sung, um, when you first practice, it's very important to go through your whole body because we're, you know, our bodies, you know, in the West, we think of 
all the systems of our body, our respiratory system, our circulatory system, our digestive system. But in reality, all of it is one thing, and it all works together. So doing the entire body is very useful because it catches things that, you know, I mean, you might have something not feeling well in your knee, but it might be that noticing and releasing something in your opposite shoulder is what's going to clear that out. You never know what it's going to be. But down the road, you can actually kind of be more localized in terms of this sung that you use. So, um, uh, you know, you injure something and you just, you know, work on a little bit above it and a little bit below it. That's another way you can do it. So you can do it more for specific things. I'm just wondering, is it necessary to always do this standing up or could you do it sitting down? Um, is there a difference? Yeah, so the, the question is, do you want to do this um, always standing or is there a way of doing it sitting down? Generally speaking, um, well, let me, let me give the more complex answer first, then I'll go back to the easier one. Um, in, in the Taoist tradition, there's five modes for practicing meditation. Um, sitting, you know, most people think of meditation as sitting, and that's, that's a big one. But standing is one, lying down, moving, and partner practices, which include sexual practices. Those are the five things that the Taoists came up with that they do when they're doing meditation. So um, the reason that, so, so part of the answer is yes, you can do it in other, not just standing, there's other times you can do it. You can do it when you're practicing Tai Chi. But it's a lot easier to learn when you're not moving. Um, lying down, people tend to fall asleep when they lie down and meditate. It's, it's actually more of a challenge doing that, I think. Um, but the, base, the, the beginning level of this, which is called outer dissolving, you're dissolving, which we'll talk about more in a second, you're dissolving away from your body. Um, it's dealing more with your physical body and your chi or energy body. So it's the two basic levels of energy. Um, when you get into meditation, you get into things like emotions, psychic body, um, karma, karma, did I miss one? Emotions, mental, um, psychic, and karmic bodies. That's really more the realm of meditation. Sitting is probably the more common, most common way that's done, but again, it can be done in any of those ways. So the standing is because you're dealing with more physical things. Having that effective gravity thing is very important. However, if you're sitting, you still want to deal with that, especially with your upper body. So you don't want to collapse your spine when you're sitting to practice. So, sorry, sometimes, sometimes the answers are more complex than the question seems like it should be. So, um, we, we sort of started doing the next, the next piece of the puzzle here. Um, which is scanning our energy. But I, I kind of had you focus more just on your physical body. Most people can manage, you know, having awareness of their physical body before they can become aware of their energetic bodies. It's a little more subtle to do that. Um, so let me read another verse from the Dai Ching to kind of move, in, move into this one. This is chapter 76. Uh, humans are born soft and flexible. In death, they become stiff and hard. Plants are born soft and pliable. When dead, they become brittle and dry. Therefore, those who are stiff and rigid become disciples of death, while those who are soft and yielding become disciples of life. The hard and stiff break. The soft and supple triumph. And I can never... I can never see that verse without thinking of the biblical phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth. It kind of is in the same, the same realm there. So the idea here is that we're trying to soften up things in our body. Um, the physical tissue is kind of obvious. It becomes less obvious when you start getting into the energies of it. So at some point, if you practice this over time, you want to shift um, more from the physical to energetic qualities of what you're doing. And um, I'm gonna just read a small section of, of the, from the Energy Gates book. Um, I mentioned the four conditions that, um, to pay attention to when you're, when you're practicing this, which is a strength, a sense of strength, any sense of tension, any sense of contraction, or anything that doesn't feel quite right. So let me just read this section that kind of explains um, getting more into the energetic sense of those four things. 
So strength. Feeling sensations of physical strength are common. Energetic strength is just as tangible once you become sensitive to feeling the inside of your body. However, what that strength is specifically attached to may be vague. It might be that you have an excess of chi in an area that, you, that may also be related to stubbornness or pride. If it feels like blocked energy strength to you, it probably is. Do not try to analyze it any further than that. Trust your feeling and intuition. So it might be that you notice something that's strength, but you're not sure if it's physical strength or some kind of energetic strength, some kind of emotional strength. It could be any of those things. Uh, the second one is tension, and this relates to any two forces inside you that are in conflict, such as physical spasm or where some emotional or mental conflict subliminally, subliminally lives inside your body. Um, and that makes me think of, a, a, if you think of like a baby who has fallen and hurt him or herself, often what people will do is get some toy or something and you can distract the baby and they forget that they're in pain for a few minutes. But then if you take the toy away, then they remember they have pain and they start crying again. So we have this ability to shift our attention away or towards something and cause it to give us more or less effect, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so the third one, contraction. The blockage of chi can cause physical constriction in your muscles, internal organs and blood vessels, or emotional constriction such as the suppression of anger or sadness. So things where places in your body have shut down in some way is another way of thinking about that. And then anything that doesn't feel quite right um, is what you generally just call some sort of energetic blockage which is difficult to verbalize in the mind, but are nevertheless tangible, such as general nonspecific feelings of unease, discomfort, vague pain, or places you cannot feel at all. And those places you can't feel at all are sometimes the hardest ones to find. You know, it's very easy to know where some part of your body is when it hurts. You know, how many people who don't have back pain think about their backs very often? Anyway, when something feels right, you can definitely feel a sense of aliveness in that spot. Although again, sometimes it's harder, easier or harder to feel that. So those are, that's kind of the next phase is, is as you're doing that, scanning and sinking through your body, paying more attention to the subtle energetic things that are going on. Um, and just a couple of points related to that that are, that are good to know, um, uh, which kind of falls under the category of awakening chi or awakening your awareness of chi. Um, it takes time, so it's not going to happen. If you come to my workshop this weekend, you'll start learning how to do it, but you may not get it all by the end of the one-day workshop. Um, very important is that it's a feeling, and you want to actually be able to feel what's going on, not visualizing what it is. That's actually a really big one in, in, the Dao, in this tradition of Taoism. The, the, the tradition of Lao Tzu, which is commonly called the water tradition, is all about that, is about feeling what's actually going on. Um, later traditions of Taoism in China were more heavily influenced by Buddhism and some other things, um, and they're often called the fire traditions, um, which tend to have more visualization practices earlier in the process. So it doesn't mean you never visualize things, but when you're, especially when you're starting out, you want to make sure you actually feel what's going on so that you're not, uh, what's that phrase, denial? Denial is not just a river in Egypt, <laughs> right? You want to actually, you know, you can visualize something and it isn't actually so. Um, you want to wake up your nervous system. The nervous system is, is one of the main places in the body where your energy or chi flows. So there's things like your acupuncture meridians and other energetic meridians. There's your nervous system and your blood and other fluids. Those are the three main places where energy travels through your system. So getting the nerves awake can really help that process. Um, you want to keep the mind stable because it's not, you know, this is an energetic exercise, not physical or intellectual. Um, and, and we have this, I mentioned that we're kind of like monkeys in this in many ways. In one way is that we have a very short attention span. And in China, they call that the monkey mind. 
you know, because you know, you're, li you're listening to me, but you're probably also thinking, these chairs are uncomfortable, I'd really like to get home and have my, my bourbon and watch TV or something when I get home. Um, oh no, I forgot to do that. So you know, our minds are always kind of doing that jumping around thing. When you're practicing these um, inner uh, practices of trying to become aware of inside your body, you have to really be able to let that stuff go to focus on it. Um, there's no advantage to trying to rapidly progress through this. So there's, you know, trying to learn all of these stages in a weekend is not really gonna, going to help you and will probably slow you down ultimately. And at the end of the day, one of the purposes for doing this is, is to get it, not just so your physical body is more relaxed or sung, but also that your energy or chi is more relaxed. And that's actually a path towards, um, you know, one of the goals of many meditation traditions is finding emptiness. At least in Taoism, they often call it emptiness. It may be called something else in other traditions. But that's kind of where you're going for, is you start to get a taste of, what does it feel like when I'm not blocked? Emptiness. And that's sort of a, it's sort of a window into things like consciousness. So being able to kind of have an experience of that. Even if you get a little experience, you can kind of start the process of waking that up. So what you're talking about um, more than just your physical body in terms of relaxation, then your etheric body, you would try to relax that energy outside of your body? Yeah, so the question is, in addition to your physical body, do you also want to relax your energetic or etheric body outside your physical body? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Yeah, so basically, I, I sort of said this already, but blocked, um, places where chi is blocked, whether it's inside your physical body or outside, are the, is the thing that generates specific feelings. Ouch, that hurts. Oh no, I'm upset. <laughs> These are usually caused by some kind of blockage in your system rather than it being relaxed and empty. Next thing I'm gonna talk about is the outer dissolving process, which is kind of the, the um, you know, once, you, once you get the basic comfort with standing and being able to scan through your energy, uh, the outer dissolving process has to do with finding those blockages and more specifically dissolving them and allowing that dissolved energy to re reconnect with just the energy that runs your body. So the, um, the analogy that the Taoists use for this is and the Taoists are known for using very simple analogies so that most anybody can understand it. Um, but the analogy is ice to water, water to gas. So in the same way that if you take an ice cube and set it out in a bowl, um, what will happen eventually? It will melt into water. But if it gets cold enough, that will reform into ice. So what you also want is that third step, water to gas, where it evaporates and just reforms, re-becomes part of the water vapor in the air. So energetically, the same sort of thing. When you find a blockage in your system that fits one of those four conditions we talked about, with your mind, you just kind of penetrate that area and in the same way that, you know, if there's, if there's uh, water in a stream going around rocks over many, many days and years and centuries, it'll wear down those rocks. So the same way the Grand Canyon was formed, right? So that's the same way it works in your body. Your mind goes through these areas, find these, these blockages, and then dissolves away what it can. Now, it may not get all of it the first time, um, but it might get it enough to make you feel better for now. And then you might get deeper the next time and more the next time. Um, when we get into the inner dissolving later, that's how you get even farther into it, which we'll talk about in a moment. Let me read one more um, verse from the Tao Te Ching, which is related to this. This is chapter 78. Nothing in this world is as soft and yielding as water. 
yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. The soft overcomes the hard, the gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. So in some ways that seems kind of counterintuitive, because if you want to get rid of something, what's our usual thought? Get a sledgehammer, <laughs> you know, whatever you need to do. Um, which I think is why they put that last line in there, that it's, it's difficult to do. Everyone knows this is true, but it's hard to do. So one of the, one of the questions might be, why, why would I do, put in the effort to do this dissolving step and not just do the sinking part? Um, and uh, w one of the reasons, well, um, the sinking practice is actually very common in a lot of martial arts because just doing the sinking is one of the things that helps develop internal power, which is kind of a useful skill to have if, you want to, if you're a martial artist. Um, but in terms of your health, and that's health both, that could be physical health, energetic health, emotional health, et cetera, et cetera, getting those things cleared out of your system is the thing that actually helps with that the most. So for example, um, a really good time to do a nice thorough dissolving session is right before you're going into surgery. So that you get your system, your energetic system cleared out nicely before they do whatever they're gonna do. It will probably make the healing process work better. You know. um, if you hurt yourself, you, know, you get an injury, start dissolving right away. Um, a, a really interesting version of this that, I, that a colleague of mine had once is um, someone who's, who was allergic to bee stings, got stung by a bee, started having rash or whatever happens, but then but realized that started dissolving right away while waiting for the ambulance to show up. They got down to like just above their knee and after they were out of the hospital, they only had the rash from their knee down, but it didn't, it didn't set up. So that's a really interesting example of, of that happening. So um, I'm not gonna, for the, for the sake of time, um, I'm not gonna have you do this right now, but, I'll, but it's something you can certainly do on your own. Um, well, so there's two exercises to kind of really get in your mind what the sense of this dissolving is. The first one I already mentioned, which is set out an ice cube and watch it. Watch it dissolve and then watch it evaporate. Now, that takes a lot of patience because it takes a little time to do that. I'd recommend doing that on a warm day <laughs> in the summer, but it's really quite interesting to watch that happen. You know, if you have a situation where you can kind of, you don't necessarily have to like watch it the whole time, but keep an eye on it through the course of it doing that. But the more physical way of doing this, and again, I'm not gonna have you do this just for the sake of time, but if you clench your fist, you know, so your white knuckles turn white really hard. And then that's sort of the ice phase. My fist is ice. And then over time, not physically letting it go, but with my mind, what can I do with my mind to allow my fist to soften and release and relax? That's the ice to water phase. Then the water to, uh, sorry, the ice to gas phase is then just continuing to allow the hand of its own accord and with your mind. So not physically opening my hand, but just allowing it to open. So it takes a little bit of time, but something you can practice. But it really helps you get a physical sense of how that can feel. Um, and I have a note, oh yes, um, just two, two quick things. I'm just, going to pull up the book here. I didn't feel like typing everything into my notes. Um, so over time, um, and, and we'll get into the, more of the meditation aspect of this as well, but you know, we start with paying attention to our physical body and the energy that runs our physical body or our chi, but that's kind of the gateway into then also noticing your emotional energy and your psychic energy, et cetera, et cetera. 
so that's kind of the principle of why you start there and work your way in, because it's harder to feel those more subtle, subtle energy levels. Um, what I should mention is that the, the Taoist view of the energy bodies is that each energy body both goes farther outside your physical body. So your chi body might end, say, here, but your emotional body might go all the way to the moon, and then your psychic body goes farther, you know. So that's, that's the general idea. But it also goes equally distant inside. So it, each energy body begins deeper inside your body as well. So sometimes even just practicing things that are physical and energetic might release emotions or, some, or you might get an emotional state because of that, because they are all related. And then the other thing, um, and I'm gonna read this paragraph because th this is related to water and the, the heading here is be gentle with yourself. So if you do these practices, there's no, there's no benefit in forcing it. So it says, do not force your chi. Taoism is the path of gentleness, of flowing water. Do not try to push the river. It's like herding cats, pushing the river. If you have a block you cannot dissolve, go around it and dissolve the rest of your body. Eventually you'll be able to dissolve it. There's absolutely no rush. So I kind of mentioned that. It takes time to wear these things down in your system. Um, one, one, one uh, for lack of a better term, one aha moment that I had with this is um, quite a few years ago I was, I was visiting my parents, but some kind of argument ensued about something. And I was off you know, driving somewhere for work or something like that and driving along the highway and I was just kind of angry and pulled into a rest area and I started meditating for a minute. And I, and I sort of was doing this process more in the meditation realm. And I got to the point where I thought the thing was that was the problem. And I realized that there was nothing there. It had already gone away. So I had somehow worked on that before without realizing it. And the moment where I needed, needed to work on it, I realized it had already happened. <laughs> so you know, that was an interesting moment that kind of clicked in, and, and clicked in my brain and I remember that. Um, and then the, the one last thing I wanted to mention before we talk a little bit about um, meditation and inner dissolving is that uh, in addition to just kind of gener generically going through each level and finding those blockages, um, another place you can focus on for dissolving are what are called the energy gates of your body, which is why the book is, the system is called opening the energy gates of your body. But these are specific places in your body that are like... Um, energetic power plants and substations, if you think of an electrical grid. So things like your lower dantian and your third eye, places like that are kind of the most powerful places. But then, for example, the inside of every joint in your body, and there's lots of things that are joints where all your ribs connect to your spine and sternum, things like that, in between all of your bones of your fingers, those are really all joints. Um, but also inside all, all of your internal organs, um, and some other places. So there's, there's lots of these energy gates in your body. But if you can hit those, those are the things that power everything in your system. So dissolving blockages in the energy gates, or, or another way of saying it is dissolving the energy gates to help relieve blockages is a really good approach to this. Because hitting, getting one of those dissolved will often get other things that will not um, be dissolved as easily, if that makes sense. So. Um, again, in a, in a one-day workshop, I can't go through all of the, all of the energy gates. Um, the ones that are in the book are still not even all of them. It's the basic ones to get started with. Um, but if you start, one of the nice things with these practices is if you get, if you can get a few really well, then it becomes much easier to do the rest of them. <laughs> you know, rather than kind of doing a few of them sort of okay, then it becomes harder to actually get through the rest of them along the way. So, okay. So the, the sort of, well, first of all, th this process of outer dissolving is the one that's really useful for just your general health. So if, if that's you know, where your um, attention lies, that would be the one I would recommend most people do. Um, but all of these health practices from Taoism, Taoism is the, probably the religion or spiritual tradition in the world that focuses most upon the physical body. And they have endless, endless practices for doing stuff with your physical body. But that's a great 
place for dealing with energy and spirit and other things too. So that's why that's one of the reasons why they why they did that. Um, you know, one 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 thing that happened is um, Zen Buddhism, which comes from Chan Buddhism in China, um, which was high, heavily influenced by Taoism. Chan Buddhism has a lot, had a lot of those body practices, but when it got to Japan, they lost a lot of that. So a lot of um, you know. Zen Buddhists, until they realized this doesn't work so well, you know, didn't have such great physical bodies, even though they might have been amazing meditators. They didn't have those practices to keep their body running well. Meditation takes a lot of energy. So the more your body can handle that, it's very useful. That's one of the reasons the Taoists came up with all of these practices. So um, meditation and inner dissolving. One last uh, Daddy Ching verse. This is just a section of it. From chapter 15. Can you find the patience to wait until your dust settles and the water becomes clear? So this, this is the goal, is to be clear inside. But if we put some, you know, powder of some sort that was colored, stir it up, it would kind of all be floating around in there, you know, but eventually all that stuff will just settle down to the bottom and the water becomes clear again. That's kind of what happens in your body. You have all these blockages and energetic things and emotions and whatever is going on, but getting that to all settle out so that your um, energetic system, your nervous system, everything, your emotions, your thoughts can be clear. That's one of the goals of, of Taoist meditation. And probably that's not too different from a lot of other traditions too, you know, because people are trying to reach that state of um, union with universal consciousness or whatever you want to call it. But you have to be fairly open to that before it can happen, I think is the general way that's talked about in a lot of those traditions. So the difference between inner dissolving and outer dissolving is the direction you do the last step. So you do the ice to water the same way, you find a blockage, you dissolve it to water. But then rather than releasing it out away from your body, you actually want to release it into the space inside your body. In the Taoist tradition, they consider that you have as much space inside your body as there is in the entire universe. And whether you believe that or not, that's okay. But the idea is that as you dissolve things away, it creates a sense of space. And then that's where you, when you, where you send it to. Um, but it's that space, especially when you get into the deeper energy channels, that can help connect you to the, some of the places you need to go to kind of move farther along in meditation. Um, but you, you do that still in the same way, where you start at the top and work your way down. And the, the, um, I, was, I was reading the example of this in my, my teacher's meditation book, and he talks about, well, he talks about two things. One is that, when, when you're at a particular level, in outer dissolving, you kind of maybe just go into the first room or maybe the second room and deal with stuff there, and then you, then you go down to the next level or floor and deal with that. Um, but, but he talks more about it being like a skyscraper, and you go into one floor, and you want to go through all the rooms on that floor, and there might be like you know, a room you didn't know was there. You go into one room, and then there's another room behind it. So you might find a blockage and then you find the blockage behind that blockage that might be causing that blockage. And maybe one, you know, that can go on for a while. So it's a more, you know, it takes a little bit longer, it's more precise, kind of sticking with it and finding those deeper things in your system that you want to dissolve. So he talks about taking a tall building down to the next floor. But then I thought, you know, in ancient China, they didn't have elevators yet. <laughs> I mean, the Chinese came up with a lot of inventions that we, that we forget that they did, but I don't think elevators was one of them. Um, although, you know, they might have had some, you know, they probably had something similar to that in certain contexts, but not generally in, in buildings people were in. But I was thinking, like, if you think of, if you want to be more, uh, um, you know, romantic about it, you can think of, like, a Chinese pagoda starting on the top level and then working, your, you're going down the stairs to the next level and going down, so... I'm guessing that's maybe where that came from originally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the outer dissolving deals primarily with your 
physical energy and the energy that runs your physical body. Meditation is really the realm of your emotions, your mental energy, your psychic energy, karmic energy, and eventually the, the, the um, uh, thing that makes you what the Taoists call the body of individuality, so the, the place where you're a unique individual. And then the last body, they only have eight, the last one is called the body of Tao, which is reconnecting with everything. But again, that's very similar to what many medit meditation traditions are after, reconnecting with that unity of everything. Um, we talked about the dust settling in your system. Um, so w one thing about that is, as you're doing the dissolving, if you're lucky and you dissolve something, it will be a permanent thing. But most of the time, it's not. <laughs> you'll dissolve it and dissolve it and dissolve it, and you'll think you got there, and then maybe the next time you'll realize, oh, there's still, still some of that left. <laughs> You know, because when you, when you get to a certain point, you're talking about vibrations, and vibrations can be very subtle. Um, you know, light is vibration, sound is vibration, all energy is some kind of vibration. And, and, you know, whenever you have something happening, there's some kind of energy behind it that's causing it to happen. So you might get rid of the thing, but the energy behind that thing might still be there. You might have a thought, but where does that thought come from? There's some, some energy causing the thought to begin. So it's always these layers. It's kind of like peeling and you know peeling the layers of an onion away to find what's the you know where is this really starting and coming from. Um, so all of these all of this qigong and neigong practice that the Taoists came up with are really considered to be preparatory practices for meditation. They set up the conditions to provide you a better chance of succeeding in your meditation practice. Although a lot of those things are really useful for your health and well-being otherwise, which is why I practice Tai Chi and teach Qigong and all those kinds of things. Um, but one of the things that can happen just by doing those practices is you might get a little glimpse into that realm of emptiness or something. You know how when you're doing something, and it m might even not be doing that practice, if you have some other discipline you do, music or art or whatever, sports sometimes. You know, people get into that place they call the zone for just that, just that moment. That's, that's really what that's about. It's, you get a little glimpse of what that emptiness is like. That place where there's no struggling against things for things to happen, You're just, it just happens. So that's why it's useful to have um, body, mind-body practices to get you set up for meditation. Especially if you do sitting meditation, you know, traditionally people would alternate between sitting practices and moving practices, or maybe standing practices too, not just sticking with one, because you probably won't get it all by doing just one of them. You, some people might, but not most of us probably need, need that um, variety. And then a couple last things that are, that are kind of big things in terms of the difference between doing the outer dissolving and the inner dissolving. Um, one, is, one is the quality of your mind. Um, I guess that's kind of covers both of these. But find, you know, when you need that level of awareness to find these places that you're trying to dissolve, the level of what you could call awareness or intent or the, the kind of present the level of presence you have to have is quite a bit high. The requirement for it is quite, quite a bit higher. So it takes a little bit of practice to get there. And one of the impediments to that is, is uh, what in Chinese they call the monkey mind. I, think I might have mentioned this earlier, you know, where you have thoughts, you know, thoughts coming in. Um, you know, either you or you know people who are easily distracted. Like, ooh, a shiny thing, isn't that nice? You know, so we're, you know, we're always kind of thinking about this. You know, we have these things now where we can, we can divert our attention away from almost anything to almost anything in an instant. So, so the, the um, one way of managing that is what's called focusing on the motion of the mind. So for example, um, if, if you have a stream and there's a stick floating down it and then a, a leaf, whatever, you know, candy wrapper, you know, each of those is kind, of, is kind of like a thought and you can kind of pay attention to those. And you just kind of go, oh, yeah, that's a thought, that's this. But you don't really attach to it, you just kind of let it let it keep going. 
So the first step is kind of being able to just notice that motion of the mind. But a deeper level of, of really gaining that presence is to be able to focus on what's called the mind stream, which is really more like the water in the stream. What's the thing behind those thoughts? What's the origin of those thoughts? And, it, and, it's, and, it, and in your system, the mind stream is something that kind of is like an unbroken, continuous thread. So if you can, if you can find that and kind of pay attention to that, that'll help um, eliminate that distraction of all those thoughts and whatever else coming through and give you the help give you that presence to be able to um, focus on deeper levels of dissolving. So. So, um, let me just mention before we take questions that uh, um, for people who are um, here, I'm glad to talk to you afterwards if you're interested in knowing some other resources for learning about this, this thing. We can probably post that on the uh, video maybe later as well. Um, my teacher's written a number of books on both Qigong, Neigong, as well as meditation. So there's some um, uh, sources out there to help, help with that. Um, and then this Saturday, for those of you who can come, I'm teaching, as I mentioned, the opening the Energy Gates um, Qigong workshop, which a large part of that will be going through this outer dissolving process, but also getting the alignment set up and some of the other things that make it work a little bit better, um, as well as several movement practices um, that are a good, a good foundation um, and they're generally, um, except for one of the movements, uh, generally easier to learn than, for example, Tai Chi, where you're doing, you're doing a different movement after a different movement. These are more, you're doing the same movement over and over again. So it's a little bit easier to learn and gives you a really good foundation for learning that type of thing. So. Yes, could you give a specific example of inner dissolving and how you would use it to benefit? That's a trickier question than it sounds like because one thing, and, and you'll find this in, in you know, most traditional meditation traditions, um, that if you, if you place a goal or an outcome or a result on your meditation practice, that kind of defeats the purpose of it. That being said, the, you know, a general goal of meditation is to have that reconnection with, you know, the Taoists would say the Tao, or the universe, or God, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, if that's something you're interested in, that would be your reason to do it. But specific goals for meditation generally are less. Um, they're a little dicier, I guess, is a good way of saying that. That, that being said, also, um, there, there are many, many studies that show that practicing meditation can have all kinds of health benefits. And one of the things that, that the West is just sort of starting to realize that the East, Eastern practices have known for a long time is that we are not just our physical matter. We are part of, you know, we're made of the same stuff that's all the stars and all the galaxies are made out of. Um, if you look at, look at disciplines like astrology, which some people will say, oh, that can't possibly have any effect. Well, does the moon affect us when it comes closer to the earth? Do we have tides that affect the oceans? You know, everything out there is interrelated and it's connected. So if you, um, if you do have a meditation practice, like I said, you may not want to have a specific goal, but generally, it's generally accepted that practicing meditation will probably benefit you in other ways too. So it could be a health, health thing, it could help your emotions. Um, if you do have a specific health problem, I in addition to just doing meditation, I would certainly recommend you know, getting professional health care, but also looking at what other mind-body practices might be targeted for that. So that's something I've learned along the way is that in, the, in Neigong and Qigong, there's lots of ways to do practices 
to help certain conditions or situations. So again, sorry for the kind of complex answer, but do you want to follow up on that, or is that? Yeah, maybe if I can just do a quick uh, follow-up. Uh, you know, I think I understand the outer uh, dissolving, you know, as it would relate to our body. The inner resolving, uh, inner dissolving, would it be more like achieving a state of mind? It, it could be, yeah. I mean, and but you know, things in your problems you have in your physical tissues might be caused by things that aren't physical. So not, you know, sorry to bring up a, a very bad example, but someone who experienced being tortured. You know, the physical, the physical stuff is easy to get over. Once the torture stops, you heal and you don't have that anymore. But what do people have for years and years after that? You know, and do you want to carry that with you for the rest of your life, or do you want to let it go? So, um, and actually, this is helping me get to maybe a closer answer to your question, which is that if you had something, some kind of traumatic experience in your life, it's one thing to carry the memory of it, but it's another thing altogether to carry the inner feeling of it for the rest of your life. You know, being able to remember that something happened might not be pleasant, but if it doesn't, you know, but, you know, you could all think of think of like the worst thing that happened in your life, and what does it do to your body when you think of it? You know, people tend to tense up or something happens, but if you can let if if you can think of something without it doing any effect to your health or your physical body, that could be a great benefit. In response to a much earlier question, you suggested that we should try to relax our energy body which sounds challenging. Um, how do you relax energy? Is it a matter of reducing the frequency? Or is there something else involved? You're giving me all these challenging questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, so one thing I said earlier is that, you know, the first practice we did, I said, we're just focusing mostly on our physical body. But I, th I I think it's a matter of over, over time, your awareness can become um, more sensitive to more subtle energies. So the energy, well, let me, let me give you the, sim the simple example. If you take your two hands and face them towards each other and move them f closer and farther apart, you can circle them, you can push and pull. Almost everyone will eventually feel something that's not your physical tissue that feels different than that. And I always say, do this with kids. They'll pick it up in like two seconds. Mm -hmm. So just by doing that, you know that you can sense energy differently than physical. The, 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 the challenge is, is being able to do that every place. And not doing it physically, but doing it with your mind and intention. So, so yes, I agree, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's, it's something that we all have the capability of doing and just take some time and practice to do it, I think. So when we were doing the exercise, I, I guess I was visualizing actual water, like a waterfall inside of me draining down. And when we finished and, and sat down again, it felt like I'd been on a plane, like my feet were swollen. I could tell because my boots are not, they're kind of tight anyway, and they were really <laughs> tight. And I thought, whoa, so has water in my body actually moved down into that, my that feet? Can that can certainly be an effect of that, yeah. Because what are, what are we mostly made of? Fluids. So, absolutely. So I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, wh um, whether the, whether the visualization or not was the thing that caused that, I don't, I don't know. You know. In Taoism, they would call visual, at this level, they would call it visualizing a fudge. You know, we say, like, we're going to fudge it. You know, like, if you don't know how to actually do it, you can visualize doing it. And what that might actually do is help you then to actually be able to feel. I didn't say that earlier, but that's, that's a way you can, you know, if you can't actually feel something, it doesn't hurt to visualize feeling it, because then maybe you will be actually be able to feel it. But then well. I guess my question really is, is that what's supposed to happen? <laughs> Are we <laughs> supposed to be moving all the water to our feet? Because it didn't feel entirely comfortable. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, 
Let me answer that in a more practical way, which is that um, in, in the energy gate system, um, in addition to the standing practice, there are moving practices. And one, one of the practices in that is getting, place, getting various places in your body to move, one of which is the area right behind your Achilles tendon, I'm sorry, in front of your Achilles tendon, is one of the major um, pumps in the body that helps blood return back up to the heart. You know, a lot of, there are a lot of medical conditions caused by fluids pooling in your legs, especially in, in the modern world where people aren't moving as much for their jobs and things like that. So, um, so this falls into what the Taoists would call the 70% rule, which is you never do anything beyond about 70% of your capacity. So for example, in your case, if you find that you're getting that too much hydraulic pressure in your legs, that might be a key to maybe stop and then do a moving practice to help get the fluid moving back again. And then maybe the next time won't, that won't happen as much. So, so I don't know if it's supposed to happen or not, but, <laughs> but it's, not, it's not unusual for when you're doing um, energetic practices because the fluids and the energy are very related for fluids to change. You know, one thing that commonly happens when people do Qigong is their hands will get warm because the blood flow out into all the little capillaries is stronger. But one of the adjuncts to that is that all those little capillaries you have in your hands are the same type of thing you have around your internal organs. So you get more blood flow to your internal organs. And this is where these, these um, mind-body type practices, I think, are in some ways better for health than, say, what we commonly call like aerobic practices. You know, aerobic practices are good for getting your heart beating, and it gets the blood to flow through your big veins, but it doesn't do such a good job of getting the blood out into those very small areas, which is really what nourishes your, your internal organs, which is much better for your health than just nourishing your muscles. So sorry, that went off on kind of a tangent. <laughs> Anything else, or that's good? Okay. When you were talking about dissolving in the body something, is how it's important to have a quality mind. Do you mean anything like a quality of attention? Yes. To be specific, holding in certain area, of like a monkey mind tend to jump off and not to feel. Is there is anything you can... Yeah, share how to increase that attention, how to get the, you know, good, good attention, how to improve your quality of the mind? Yeah, yeah, and w yeah what I had said is that um, the, um, the, the quality of your mind is important, not that you have, you all have quality minds, we'll just, <laughs> we'll just assume that. Um, but that, yeah, that's when I was talking about the, um, that motion of the mind thing. And, the, and the gen, you know, one, one way that I learned of dealing with that, and I, and I don't know where it is, I know it's in one of my teacher's books, there's, a more, there's more things about this. But the one I can think of right away is that um, whenever a thought arises, what you want to do is not attach to that thought. You want to just notice that it's there. So you, so you don't want to kind of do either extreme of there's a thought, I really want to pay attention to it, or trying to deny that you're having thoughts. Because the more you deny your, oops, the more you deny having thoughts, chances are the more thoughts you'll have, because they try to, they really want to come out. So it's finding that middle ground or that balance point where you can recognize, I'm having a thought, it's not really what I want to be focusing on, but it's there and that's fine. So just kind of letting it go. Um, and in fact, you know, one, one way of talking about Taoist meditation is it's the art of letting go. So the more you can not have attachment to those things, but just, you know, not saying that they don't exist, but just let it happen, let it, let it follow out. Just a quick follow on that. When we're doing this standing meditation or standing practice, when we're moving around and focusing on a certain area and then moving to another area and then continuing that process on down our body, that movement, I would think, would go a long way toward keeping somebody focused and away from a monkey mind just by doing that, just as when you're breathing and you focus on your breath, that breath begins to absorb your thoughts. 
Sure, yeah, and, there, and there's lots of med- there's lots of thank you. There's lots of practices in meditation, like looking at a candle or you know, focusing on on you know a spot on the wall or something like that. So, yeah, things that can things that can focus your attention. And yeah, absolutely, these these practices as a few of you that are in my class can verify this. Do I ever run out of details that I can give you about how to do things? Yeah. So there's, there's kind of an endless array of things that you can be paying attention to. So if one's not working, you can always find another one. That's good. Um, just basically a follow-up to her question about the sinking feeling and the heaviness and the swelling in the legs. Uh, two points to it. There's an axiom in Chinese medicine that blood flows where energy leads. So like you were talking about the palms getting red uh, when you meditate, when you do Qigong. Um, and the follow-up to that is intent. So when you are already thinking about, about that and about sinking the qi, sinking the energy, that's your intent of where you want it to go. It's much like when an acupuncturist puts a needle in somebody the outcome of the treatment in most cases is based on the intent of the practitioner and where they want that chi to go. So would that be kind of along the same lines? Absolutely, yep, yep. And, and, and um, you know, a really, a really sim- simpl- simplified version of Chinese medicine is that if the chi is flowing somewhere, your health, it's healthy. If it's not flowing there, you're unhealthy. So yes, any, any sensation of more fluid, heat, energy, sometimes electricity because the nervous system wakes up, any of those things can indicate that more, um, more and or better energy is getting to those places in your system. Yeah, thank you. That's, that is a very good analogy to that. Ah, so thinking about dissolving because I, I have some neck and back pain right now. I'm going to acupuncture tomorrow, actually. Um, I'm wondering if instead of visualizing it going down, like water flowing down, what if the water was to turn to steam and just kind of go off? I'm just curious yeah, about well this that's, process. Is well that that's, part of the yeah, dissolving? So that's the, the dissolving thing is ice to water, water to gas. So the gas phase of that is the important, the important end one to do. So it becomes like water, but then when you dissolve it, it like gas, it becomes like water vapor and or steam and goes away. So you're doing a combination of going down and going away. So when we did the first practice, we were just focusing on the down. So maybe that's why it pooled more. <laughs> But if you're doing the full dissolving, then you're doing both layer by layer as well as the um, water to gas phase where it goes out into your energy field. So, and again, just, just to, to reiterate, when you're doing dissolving, if you have, like I said, you mentioned you had some neck and shoulder pain, you might dissolve that area and you might still have neck and shoulder pain, but then you might dissolve in something in your leg and that might be the thing that releases it. Because our bodies are not only physically interconnected, they're also energetically in- interconnected. So that's why we do the whole thing. Because <laughs> you never know what you're gonna hit at any one, one spot. 